Dear sisters and brothers in Christ, may God's grace, mercy, and peace be with you now and always. Amen. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you for giving us freedom in this great nation, for giving us opportunity to worship together freely. Lord, help us each day to take advantage of those freedoms, to seek out those opportunities you give us to share your word and to share your love. Lord, forgive us for those times when we fail to do so, but lead us to everlasting trust in you, knowing that you are our deliverer, the one who will give us free in etern- freedom in eternity. This we pray in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Have you ever noticed that sometimes the smallest things in life have the biggest impact on you? It's those small little things that maybe for someone else, they would pass right by. They wouldn't even notice them. But for you, it has an impact. Maybe it's if you, if you go through some of your grandparents' old things, and you're sorting through, and maybe the pictures are black and white, they're so old, but as you come across them, you notice that there's a picture of you as a little child in the arms of your grandma or your grandpa. It has an impact. Maybe it's, it's a little note that your spouse writes on the back of a receipt that says, I love you. That maybe it's just stuck to the fridge or something like that. But, and while someone else might say, well, it's just a receipt with a note, but for you it's that message, I love you. Maybe it's when your children or your grandchildren, they, they, they laugh at the same corny jokes that you laugh at. Maybe it's just those small things, though, that have such an impact. Even, even maybe it's a meal that we like. You know, the other day, I was in my study at home, and I noticed there was a letter from my grandpa that should have been safely tucked away in my left-hand desk drawer because that's where everything goes, where I put those types of things. But it was out, and I can only assume that Jacob must have got into the drawer and not known exactly what he was getting into. But the letter was the letter that my grandpa sent in response to my request for him to be the preacher at my ordination. It was a letter that struck me, and there was three things in that letter that really just stood out to me. The first one was that he made reference to my placement and that he had been there, and he was sorry that Grandma had not been, but then he kind of a little comment after that, and he said, well, but that's okay because she wasn't at mine either. Fifty years earlier, she had also missed his. The second thing that struck me was the text that he preached on. He had shared it, and it was 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul's words. As Paul wrote those words, he said, I resolve to know nothing among you save Christ and him crucified. Words that I knew were part of my grandpa's life as he not only was a father and a husband, but as a pastor himself. The last was the way he closed the letter. With all my love, Grandpa. And well, you may say that's kind of a standard greeting. My grandpa was a good old German. And so it was a rare occasion when I heard those words and to see them in print was was pretty impactful for me even as I read that letter again. And as I thought about it, as I read that letter, and, and I realized that now the Lord has called home both of my grandparents on my mom's side, I realized that the message didn't change. In particular, I realized that that verse from 1 Corinthians chapter 2 did not change. 2 verse 1, I resolved to know nothing among you except Christ and Him crucified. And how important it is for us to hold on to that truth in our changing world. How important it is for us to remember that, that we know nothing, if we know nothing else, that we know Christ and Him crucified. That nothing else brings salvation except Christ. He is our deliverer. And I think it's important we remember that truth in this world that's changing. You know, Benjamin Franklin It's often attributed to him. It's not sure that he was the first one to say this, but he said of the world, in this world, nothing can be said to be certain. Can you guys finish the quote? Except death and taxes. I know a few of you have heard it before. I thought maybe the death part is changing a little bit. Scientists are coming a long way, but he made a very good point, didn't he? Something that for many of us is a point of difficulty is the fact that our world does change constantly around us. That the message that we grew up with hearing is a different message than we hear today. The way that we dress is not the way that we see the next generation dressing. The way that we talk is not the way they talk. Even as I look and I realize that Jacob, in 30 years, how, I wonder how much different things will be for him. 
Now for many of us, we look back and we look back fondly. We look back on the generations that have gone before us and we think about how wonderful things were. We tend to idealize them. Our vision is a little obscured. We look back and we think about how much better things were. And that affects the way we look at the future. It affects the way that we look at change in our country, in our world, even in our church. When we constantly look back, when we constantly look at what that idealized time, all we can see for the future is fear and concern. All we can see is brokenness and pain and, and worry. We look at our country and we see that the values that we once held dear are not there. We look at our leaders, our laws, and we question them. We spend more time complaining about them than trying to change them. We're content to sit by passively and talk about the need for change, but not make any change and complain about any changes that are made. We know what is right, but are we willing to do what is right? This is the tension after all that Paul faced, wasn't it? Paul faced this very same tension in Romans 7. He, he describes our own tension so very well. The tension that we have of knowing what is right and doing what is right. Let me read again for you verses 21 and 22 and 23. For I delight in the law of God, in my inner being. But I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. A war waging itself inside of us. Knowing what is right and doing what is right. It may seem like a small distinction, an unimportant distinction, but as we talked about before, those small things are sometimes the most important things. And while that may seem like a small distinction, it's huge. Because putting our faith into action is important. Putting in our faith into action demonstrates God's love for others and shows others His compassion. But far too often, we're content to sit by. Far too often, we're content to be passive. We know that we're commanded throughout Scripture to care for the less fortunate, to reach out a hand of compassion to those in need. How many of us avert our eyes when we walk past someone who is, we feel beneath us just so we don't have to recognize their suffering? How many of us know God's command to love one another, to forgive one another, but hold on to grudges, refusing to let go? holding them against until the other person concedes. How many of us hold on to be that being right? That pride of being the one who is always right and unwilling to step back and admit sometimes we are wrong. How about you? Is there any spot in God's law that you find yourself knowing what he said, what he commanded, but failing to carry it out, failing to live it out in your life. It's not pleasant to think about, is it? It's one thing to teach it to our children, to our grandchildren, to instruct others in it, but it's much harder to turn that lens back on ourselves, to look at our own lives, to look at our own hearts, determine whether or not we are following what God's law has commanded or whether or not we're content to just point fingers. For many of us, we want a quick relief from this. We don't quickly fast forward and run to the gospel. We don't want to take time to wrestle with Paul's tension, whether or not we live how we're commanded to live whether or not we live how we're, we know we're meant to live. We'd rather just run right to the gospel and avoid that, that heart searching. We'd rather avoid looking and seeing if part of the way we've lived has have hurt our relationships, if part of the way that we've lived has harmed others, if part of the way we have lived has not honored God in our world before others. It's so much easier to run away from that, isn't it, than to do that heart searching to reflect back on ourselves and look at ourselves. To declare like Paul declared, O oh, wretched.
wretched man or woman that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Paul understood it. Paul understood the fact that we must take this time to look at our hearts, to look at our hearts and investigate our lives, to see our sinfulness right before us and to know its consequences, to know the way that it not only drives a wedge between us and others, but the way it drives wedges between us and God. Because, the, the, because as long as we are unwilling to face our, to face our broken lives, our broken souls, we allow a chasm between us and God to form, and it gets wider and wider. But only, only then when we reflect on it, when we look at our sinfulness, our shame, only when we bring it to the cross do we realize that Christ is the bridge of that chasm. He is the one that takes our broken life and mends them back together. He is the one who calls us to come unto Him, even despite our sinful, despicable selves. Come unto me, and I will give you rest. My burden is light. Only then can we hear that word in the fullness of the rest that He gives us. Only then can we truly know the message of the Gospel and the forgiveness of sins as Jesus gives to us on the cross. Because on the cross, He delivered us once and for all. On the cross, He delivered us from this sinful life and this body of death that we were in. And He did so freely. Out of His mercy, out of His love for us. He did so without complaint or without argument. Hear the words of Isaiah from Isaiah 53. Words that were written centuries before Christ, but words that capture him. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. So often we get caught on the first half that I think we miss the, the beauty of the second half of that verse too. That Jesus so willingly did it that he didn't try to stop it. He didn't try to, even though God of the universe could have done so, he didn't try to step in and change because he knew that it was necessary for him to be the lamb who went to the slaughter for us. To be the one who bore our pain to rescue us. So that we, like Paul, could say, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Because that is, after all, where Paul turned, isn't it? Because even in the depths of the law and the con condemnation of his sin, he turned to Christ and he found the forgiveness of sins. He turned to Christ and found the rescue. He turned to Christ and found true deliverance. And he was set free. And we too are set free when we hear those words of Christ, I forgive you. Those words of Christ to us, Christ crucified. So whether we know nothing else, we must know Christ and Him crucified. Because that points us to the Gospel that although He was crucified, He did indeed rise. He did indeed conquer death and He delivers us now from death so that we too shall one day rise with Him. And as long as we're on this earth, He gives us a foretaste of that feast, that joy that is to come. As long as we're on this earth, He gives us the promise that He will give us the nourishment we need, the strengthening we need, and He does so in the gift of His Holy Supper. And although it may seem like a small detail, He not only comes to us spiritually, but He comes to us physically. And it is such a big detail because when He comes to us physically, we not only are in communion with our brothers and sisters as we kneel before the altar, but we are in communion with Christ Jesus our Lord. We are in communion with our Savior. We are in communion with our Lord. And that is a foretaste of what is to come. A foretaste of the feast that we will share with Him in the marriage feast, which shall have no end. So I encourage you, if you know nothing else, may you know Christ and Him crucified. Amen. Please pray with me. Lord of heaven and earth, we thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to be our salvation, to be our deliverer, to set us free from this body of sin. Forgive us for those times where we know what is right and continue to do what is wrong. 
Forgive us for those times when we dwell in our sinfulness, contented to live there. May You come again to rescue us. May You come again to set us free so that we may know true freedom, true deliverance in Your Gospel. Lord, set us free so that we might live each day as Your children. Set us free so that we might live each day sharing Your love and sharing Your mercy. Set us free so that one day we might be free with You throughout all eternity. In all things we pray through Jesus Christ who is our Deliverer. Amen.